to even go up there and ask them because there's a chance that people who hope to donate and then find out they can't or whatever, they, they'll probably like to accommodate them. But right now, 11 or 11.30 would give us a full schedule for the morning, which is great. This would be wonderful. So they're there till 1 p.m. Yeah. yeah, so our, this is the last minute. Late breaking news. Yeah, so 11 and 11.30. Okay, to leave your trip and come back. It's a good call. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? on time. 10.54, okay. Okay, so we'll, I, I will conclude then for those at home. All right, um, very good. And uh, I guess we're doing the music or the preamble stuff. I'll be going in. And I'll sit up top in this room. Morning. Morning. Most of you know me, but those that don't, my name is Dean McCune, and welcome to the Good Shepherd Presbyterian Church, and welcome to those viewing from at home. We'd like to welcome you, welcome any new guests. Please raise your hand and introduce yourself if you're here for the first time. Okay. Um, summertime, you can, everybody's out and about. Um, your greeter today is Maureen Gallagher. Your ushers today are Preston and Judy Jones, Rick Fortin, and Dave Conklin. I have a few announcements for you from the bulletin. There is a blood drive today until 1 p.m., and I just, just, just in, they have two appointments left, and you can get special dispensation if you want to leave church early. Uh, <laughs> There's an 11 o'clock appointment and there's an 11.30 appointment. So if anybody would um, want to take us up on those, let us know. Um, and they'll be here until 1 o'clock today. So if you can donate blood, please do it. It's a great cause. Um, we are also collecting for Father's Day presents for uh, the migrant workers um, through... Uh, through um, Operation Hope, and as usual, we're collecting the fans, and this year we're adding small tools to that list, um, pliers and screwdrivers, things like that. If you would like to donate those, that would be wonderful. Um, they can be dropped off right out here in the hallway. Um, you can donate all the way through the 20th. And another announcement is um, at the May session meeting, we discuss, they discussed the recent guideline changes from the CDC regarding COVID-19. 
The session tasked the reopening team with gathering the congregation's feedback on your thoughts and comfort levels for how we might change in-person worship and gatherings. A short feedback form will be sent out via email and posted on the Facebook page. So please take time to fill it out before June 7th. Um, yeah, that's kind of soon. <laughs> Tomorrow, I guess. We will also have hard copies available to fill out in the church office um, this week. So maybe on the way out, you could grab one of those forms if you want. Um, thank you in advance for sharing your feedback. And um, I guess there's a special presentation. There is. You know, some people operate by the, um, the, the words WWJD. What does that mean? Oh, what would Jesus do? So you might ask the question with regards to giving blood. What would Jesus do? Would Jesus give blood? And I think uh, the communion table uh, tells us the answer to that question, doesn't it? Yeah. It's awesome. Um, Today uh, is a special Sunday um, because one in our midst has been serving the church for 10 years. Diane, I'll ask you to stand up here beside me, if you will. Uh, you know, I came to this church, and um, Diane had completed the, the work for a commissioned pastor. And uh, so we had a conversation early on about um, her serving in that capacity. That's an agreement between pastor and commissioned pastor. And uh, I was so excited uh, to have her. And as we talked, and these past 10 years has been a, a true gift uh, to minister together You're with you, Diane. Cry. And so I, I appreciate your ministry over the past 10 years. I know these people out here uh, appreciate your ministry over the past 10 years uh, at this church. And um, so in recognition of, of their graciousness for you, they want to give you that as a, uh, uh, a, a, a pale in comparison uh, gift to the, you, what you have given us. So thank you, Diane, for your ministry here. You're welcome. Yeah. Am I supposed to say something? You please. Uh, okay. Uh. Wait a minute. <laughs> Tissues. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm not in charge of that. I will say that uh, when the pastor... Uh, process was going on with uh, Pastor Scott, now Pastor, ours pastor. Um, there's a story, and I'm, fr I'm, I'm sorry that Ann and David aren't here, <laughs> and Bell came in. I was here somewhere working on something, and he said, oh, she said, oh, the new prospect is coming to church, and you've got to go hide. <laughs> and I'm like, where? <laughs> Because they were showing, it's true, they were showing him around. And so I guess I went into the choir room. I don't exactly remember that. I just remember that all of a sudden Ann shows up and says, he wants to meet you. And I went through a lot before uh, Scott came. And I had finished, and I didn't know what was going to happen with the education and where God called me. And you said to me, you introduced, and you said to me, I want you. <laughs> and that's what he said, and I will never, ever uh, forget it. But God called me for a specific reason here. He didn't let me know until later in life, but I did what he wanted, and I'm so glad that I'm here, and I'm so glad that we have an adult ministry, and I'm so glad that I can help you if you need help. And I'm so glad for my partner in crime. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let us repeat the Apostles' Creed together. Christians, what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven 
and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing.
I'll go this way. Yes, this is the four students up here. But. <laughs> what they will be doing next year and what the chords are. Okay. Sam, you go first. Mm -hmm. All right. Wow. Well, I am... <laughs> you want to take you your mask take off? Your mask. Right, so they can see your face. I am going to be going to Eastern Florida State College, um, get my two-year degree, and then proceed to more than, more than likely UPS. Um, the black chords uh, are for a technical... Accomplishment. I've got certifications in things like Adobe Photoshop. Uh, the gold cords are for having a GPA of 3.5 or above. For all four years of my course. Yeah. Right. And these multicolored cords are for um, Microsoft Office certification. Yeah. A story about Megan. When Megan and her family first came to this church, she was in second grade, and she came to Vacation Bible School, and guess who her teacher was? And it's partway through Vacation Bible School, she comes up to me and goes, Mrs. Laurie, this is for you, and I still have the bracelet she made for me that says, I love Jesus, and it hangs in my kitchen. And I'm sure, Sam, you would have done the same thing if you had been here. <laughs> Our entering confession. If God kept track of sins, who would stand a chance? But with God, there is forgiveness. May God hear our request for mercy. Merciful God, we try to hide from your presence knowing that we have traded your abundant life for a wasteland of sin. We have not followed your will, but instead heed other voices and pursue our own desires at the expense of others. We are so misguided that we cannot discern good from evil, making the wrong choice, choosing the wrong side, we ask for the courage to tell you truthfully 
what we have done. We pray for forgiveness so that we can live with ourselves, with others, and with you. You alone can restore us in steadfast love. Look upon us and reclothe us in your grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, do not lose heart. We are being renewed day by day through the grace of Christ extended to us. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father and to the please. We have a lot of prayers today. First and foremost, the family of Dana Labrizi, uh, she is Diane and Randy uh, Randolph's daughter. Passed, she passed away on May 31st um, of cancer. She is also the mother of Shauna and Sarah, and the family needs your prayers at this time. There will be no service, maybe in the future. Uh, Trudy, a friend of Dory Davich, who has been in the hospital since March and is now in rehab, prayers for her continued uh, recovery. Uh, prayers for Tyler, a son of Christina, who works at Odyssey School, a friend of Wendy Nolder. Tyler was in a bad car accident Friday night. Uh, Prayers for, uh, I'm sorry, I'll do this at the end, the other one. Brenda Reynolds, prayers for a hip replacement on June 23rd. And their anniversary is this week, their 46th anniversary for Bob and Brenda. The B&B, &B, but they don't run one, right? <laughs> prayers for Raphael Solono. Uh, he is uh, has going to have back surgery. He is Tom's, Tom, what's Tom? Tom's father-in-law, okay, for back surgery. For Kevin Burke, and I know he's home and he left a message on the machine. Did he make it to the first service? He did not. Oh, he says he's doing really well and he, it wasn't as bad as he thought. So uh, Natalie Jones is having radiation. She has had cancer all along, but it's popped up again. And she's having radiation, and she really needs prayers, as does her family. For Artie, Jean Jones' brother, who is very ill, Ivy Lawrence is having another eye surgery. Doreen Fenton for her throat. Dwayne Koch, as far as I know, uh, he has no symptoms of COVID, but he is testing COVID positive. Kathy McAndrew for the cancer treatment that will be upcoming. Rick Fortin's mother uh, with Parkinson's. She's down here now living with Rick and Brenda. And continue prayers for uh, Reverend George Wilcox, uh, for Gwen Sears, Joetta Wilcox's sister, Nancy Shalhoub, Diane Randolph, Cheryl Hoffman, Gloria Robinson. Even though she's here, she still gets prayers. And Reverend Mary Sample, and I have good news about her. She's actually, she hasn't driven, but she's actually been driven out and went to uh, pick up some food. But she's still in a lot of pain. She's had double, she's had back surgery and then cervical surgery. And it's going to be a long road for her. And those recovering from surgeries or procedures um, and shut-ins, Janet Bissett, Phyllis Eddy, Ivy Lawrence, Shirley Parrish, Artie Richards, Shirley Storm, Lee Wilson, Don Woodard, and Jack Fawcett. And for those with cancer, Ann Voss, Chip Curran, who is in rehab, Natalie Jones, John Curry, and Kinsley, Danny Monk's niece. Um, she's still, I think she's still four years old, and she has cancer through, uh, yes. So she's five now. 
Is she in the hospital still? Okay. Thank you. So prayers for all of these people, uh, not just today, but every day. Even if you can't remember their names, just hold them up in prayer because it's, uh, it's important to them. Our prayer of intercession. God of creation, you set us in a flourishing place and gave us everything needful for an abundant life. Yet we have marred your good creation. We pray for the renewal of creation as we seek to live more responsibly within it. Make us better stewards than we have been of water, soil, and air. Teach us how to live in ways that honor the habitats of every living thing. Loving God, we have also marred human relationships by emphasizing our differences and disagreements at the expense of our commonalities and connections. We pray that you will give us new understandings and ways of living with one another, doing the slow work of peace rather than turning to the quick response of war, receiving our various languages and colors as enrichments rather than deficits, caring for the least and the lost, not as unwanted burdens, but as welcome companions in your great household. Renewing God, we know so well that life is fragile. We see in our own bodies how illnesses and infirmities afflict us because you shared our human life. We come before you to ask for healing, recovery, and an end to pain and suffering. Within our community, we remember before you those in need of your care and ours. Within our own families and circles of friends, we lift up the names of the people in pain. We give thanks for the skills of doctors and nurses and health care attendants. We pray for researchers who dedicate themselves to seeking new treatments and cures and procedures that enhance our health. Strengthen all caregivers with the gifts of kindness and patience and endurance. We are grateful, O oh God, that though our bodies fail us, you renew us spiritually day by day so that we never outlive our usefulness to you. No need, no person is ever hidden from you or beyond your reach to save. Remember those we have overlooked, those whom we have forgotten or forsaken, and those who have wandered away from you. Restore them, we pray, and restore us too, until we are all your family again. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. amen. And let us pray the prayer that the Lord... Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat>
You may be seated. Hi everybody, it's Miss Eleni here with today's children's sermon. And today we're going to talk about animals. We can learn a lot from animals. I'm going to share a heartwarming story with you. There was a baby hippopotamus named Owen that was swept down a river and into the ocean when a tsunami struck and it was tossed back to shore by waves and landed on the coast of Kenya in Africa. Wildlife workers rescued him and took him to a shelter where he was adopted by a 100-year-old tortoise that acted as his mother. Isn't that so sweet? Baby hippos like to be with and play with their mothers until they are about four years old. These two, the hippo and the tortoise, although very different from each other, are fast friends that eat, sleep, and swim together. The tortoise likes being a mother and Owen likes his new mother. The two of them formed a family. How wonderful. What we can learn from this story is that close family members may come in many forms. Not all of us are blessed with families that include a mother, a father, brothers, and sisters. Families are made of people who love and care for each other. We find friends in our church and elsewhere who are loving and caring. They make good family members. Jesus says, For whoever does the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. Isn't that wonderful? All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for our friends and family. Thank you for our doctors and nurses. Thank you for our teachers and pastors. Please watch over those that are sick and hurt and help them find relief in you. Please watch over us and help us make the right choices and stay safe and healthy to come back to church or our computer screens next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye, guys. Love you. Have a great week. Well, let's take our uh, attendance, get you on the move. How's everybody doing today? You don't have to worry, I am not uh, a social network person, so I won't be sharing these pictures on my Facebook uh, uh, page or anything like that. Conversely, don't expect me to know something just because you posted it on your Facebook page. (laughs) (laughs) And now, let us sing. Holy words long preserved for our war in this world they resound with God's own heart oh let me Ancient words in heart. Words of life, words of hope, they give us strength, help us go. In this world, wherever we roam, ancient words will guide. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words in heart. Sacrifice, oh, heed the faithful words of God. Holy words, long preserved for our all in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words.
have come with open heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Oh, let the ancient words Amen. Ancient words. Ancient words. How many times have we read the passages in our Bible? Hopefully today you'll learn something new about one way that we can come to those words. Hopefully you'll be equipped by a new way to study your Bible that perhaps you did not know existed. Our passage today, oh, let me also add at the close of this service, um, for those who are uh, participating in worship at home, it is a communion service. I ask you to um, try and acquire elements uh, from your fridge and uh, pantry uh, to celebrate communion. Um, at the close of this service, we will be exiting uh, the sanctuary to participate of those elements outside. Um, so the close of worship for those worshiping at home will be at the time that we depart. Our passage today comes from the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. I say Mark that way because we have been in the Gospel of John uh, for so many uh, weeks. Mark chapter 3. Hear the word of the Lord. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family, his being Jesus, when Jesus' family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For the people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And Jesus called to them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said... He has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a lot going on in the passage, and I like to express thanks to uh, the commentaries and reflections written by David Jacobson, Eugene Boring, and John Worcester. For the contents of this sermon. Since before Easter, we've been journeying through the Gospel of John. Today, we begin our journey in the Gospel of Mark. The text from John that we have been reading since early March have shown us a confident and wise Jesus, certain of his purpose and profound in his teaching. 
He is calm, capable, and in control. We listened as John laid out for us sustained discourses by Jesus and long prayers by Jesus that are unique to John's gospel. Through John, we have also caught wind of the mystery of Jesus' intimate relationship with the Father and the continuation of Jesus' ministry through the Advocate, the Holy Spirit. In John, Jesus moves deliberately and knowingly right up to the moment of his death, which he decisively confirms by saying, it is finished. The divine nature of Jesus is on full display in the Gospel of John, in all of its depth and complexity and wonder. And over these many weeks of reading from John, we have found a measure of reassurance. The shift from John's cool and composed Jesus to the Jesus we see in this week's lesson from the Gospel of Mark can be a little jarring. Here in Mark, we encounter Jesus as a little less composed. And according to some people, witnessing the scene, perhaps a little erratic. Mark's gospel portrays Jesus in all of his humanity. As Jesus lives into the fullness of his life's purpose, Our scene today follows a fast-paced opening sequence from the Gospel of Mark, where in the space of just a couple chapters, the first chapters of Mark's Gospel, Jesus performs an impressive list of healings and exorcisms, generating astonishment and amazement from an ever-growing crowd. We have never seen anything like this, is an exclamation that happens in chapter 2. It's an example of the response to Jesus in the early part of Mark's gospel. The narrative is simply action-packed and everyone early on in Mark seems to have someone a somewhat formed opinion of this upstart Jesus, either positively or negatively. Accordingly, emotions are high And the situation is tense as this week's passage begins. While some are fully on board, others have come to believe that Jesus has gone too far. Is he too popular? Too powerful? Too outside the box? Have there been too many outsiders included in what he's talking about. Too many sinners that have been welcomed. Too many norms of society that have been violated. There is something about this Jesus that both attracts and repels. Confusing, I know. And it is for his family as well as they come in our passage today to, well, constrain him. So let that sink in just a moment. Jesus' family comes to stop, or at least to slow down, the roller coaster that has been going since the first chapter of Mark. Some say he has gone out of his mind. But perhaps really this is a way of saying that he has gone beyond our minds. That is, that he has surpassed what we might expect or imagine. The boundlessness, the inclusiveness, the unwilling to be limited by regulation or social convention. The unrestrained mercy and grace, all of it is beyond what we can fully grasp and also what Jesus' family can fully grasp. 
Jesus doesn't conform to polite society. And he seemingly has little interest in decency and in order. What kind of Presbyterian is he? (laughs) Is he insane? That is what some are asking. And Jesus' family, out of concern, sought to restrain him. Is he demon-possessed? That is what the religious elite are claiming as the scribes' voices were heard as they set their accusation. I have provided for you a breakdown of the chiastic structure of our passage today. Thank you. Chiastic? I know most of you have never heard of a chiasm. Chiasm, chiastic, chiasmos. It's a way of writing which organizes story content in, well, orderly ways. Like a poem has structure. Chiasm refers to a sequence of elements of a sentence or a verse or a paragraph or a chapter or even a whole book which then repeats, is repeated and developed but in a reverse order as the story progresses. It is a very orderly way of communicating. And this is music to Presbyterians' ears. So if Jesus Jesus wasn't confined by the Presbyterian norm of doing things decently and in order, at least the gospel writers were. I've provided with you a handout. And for those of you online or at home, you should have received it in your weekly email leading up to this worship service. If you did not or cannot find that, um, it can also be found on the church's website right now. But that handout you are going to want to have in your hand. So grab it. Chiastic structure is a thing. And before you is one way to break down this passage. I want you to notice in the handout the indentations and then the letters that are off to the left of those sections of the passage. This is our passage that we read today, Mark, 20, Mark 3, 20 to 35. In today's passage, we see two foundational institutions of life trying to exert control over Jesus to silence him, to manage him, to prod him to fall in line. The two institutions trying to handle Jesus in our text today are family and the religious hierarchy. And if we look to the A and the A prime, I'm using the word prime for that little dash that's outside the A. So the very first verse of the passage and then again the last verses of the passage are A and A prime. We see Jesus' family. And then in B and B prime, we see the religious authorities and Jesus speaking to the religious authorities. Imagine the two institutions of life on which we would normally rely and lean on. They are, in this sentence, both trying to silence Jesus. Friends, this is just a shocking realization. And one which should certainly grab our attention this morning. 
First off, A and A prime. Jesus' family is evidently worried that Jesus is causing too much of a scene. They love him. They want the best for him. And every parent, even parents of adult children, know that life can be hard and situations can be perilous and it can go sideways sometimes. Perhaps they are concerned that Jesus' Galilean ministry of healing and exorcism and controversial teaching, well, maybe they're concerned that it looks nothing like their well-known and nice traditional familial values. They are coming for Jesus to take him home. But even if that is only to say to talk things through with him. Well, that is code for, I don't get it. Something doesn't look quite right to me. Perhaps, Jesus, you're not aware of the danger that is happening. So the family comes to bring Jesus home. But family is the least offensive institution seeking to hold Jesus at bay in our story. Another layer of resistance is conveyed, located in B and B prime of our passage. The temperature certainly goes up as the religious authorities who are introduced in verse 22 open their mouths. These authorities, we are told, traveled from Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem is the religious center of Israel. What big structure is located in Jerusalem? The temple. Yeah, the temple. Hence, these authorities clearly represent the religious institution in the fact that we're told they come straight from Jerusalem. That should be obvious. These representatives have something to share, something they perhaps are anxious to share. For in their estimation, Jesus is a wild card. Jesus is dangerous. Jesus needs to be discredited. And they diagnose and then share with the gathered community that Jesus' unusual Galilean ministry is symptomatic of demonic behavior. Beelzebul, they say. This, to be sure, is a power play from the religious institution that is threatened by Jesus' ministry. Now, a word of caution on this observation. Mark's description of these scribes ought not give us a general indictment of Judaism. Rather, it is institutionalism that I believe he is speaking to, and which is the culprit. Institutionalism, from which our Christian church has also fallen prey to on numerous occasions throughout the course of the centuries. So the point in Mark 3.22 is that the power center is unsettled by Jesus' ministry. Not that Jewish faith is awry or that all scribes are off track. Jesus himself later in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 12, notes that another scribe is not far from the kingdom of God. So not all scribes are off track. So Jesus is in the midst of this attack, and I'll, I'll, this is going down a rabbit trail a little bit, but it's a rabbit trail that needs to be um, gone down because if you look at B and B prime, and I'm telling you that this is about um, the, uh, uh, the scribes and the religious institution, if you go down to B prime and you, you start asking, well, how is B prime? Doesn't really say scribes there, or how, how, what's the connection there? At the very end of that, at the very end of B prime, you see those words: "For they had said he has an unclean spirit." The they is the scribes, and verse twenty-eight says, and this is a, a, 
a verse that is problematic and has been problematic for a lot of people. Um, Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemes they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of, as, of an eternal sin. Now, this is a verse that I became aware of as a teenager, and I was like, man, I hope I don't do that. That's bad. What is this about? And people take the verse and use it in all sorts of ways, but in the structure, and because of the, the, the word for they had said, he has an unclean spirit, it's clearly referencing the scribes who came from Jerusalem and said, Jesus has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. So it has to do with their accusation that Jesus' power is coming from the devil, not God, not the Holy Spirit, and hence that's why uh, it's a blaspheme against the Holy Spirit as to who Jesus is and what power Jesus represents. So, again, that was a, a side channel. Please take it. So Jesus is in the midst between A and A prime and B and B prime, is in the midst of a two-pronged assault. A pincer move, I think the Germans called it in World War II. A pincer, his family is up in arms, and the religious authorities are raising accusations against him. Jesus' family is attempting to rein him in because they are worried about uh, this eccentric ministry of healing and exorcism and forgiveness in Galilee. And then along come the religious authorities who wish to delegitimize Jesus with the damning diagnosis of Beelzebulitis. So the outer layers of our chiasm, again, you're learning a new word, chiasm, Uh, are closing in on Jesus with the aim of closing down this Galilean ministry. All for the sake of institutions, family, and religious order. So that is what is closing in on Jesus in this written word, which then draws our eye to the center. That is section C in your handout. Section C is the center, and at the center of this passage is Jesus' clever apocalyptic parable about Satan and who and what really is going to be detained. You see, the family wants Jesus detained. You see, the religious authorities want Jesus detained. But Jesus says, no, I'm not being detained. The strong man is going to be detained. In the middle of our passage is the true power struggle. Now, since Jesus' teaching is apocalyptic and also in parables, we should proceed with caution. Jesus is not speaking in plain English, nor is he speaking in plain Hebrew, nor is he speaking in plain Aramaic. Jesus begins by summing up the scribe's argument about Beelzebul with his own question. How can Satan cast out Satan? And having reduced the scribe's argument about Beelzebul to an absurdity, really, Jesus then draws on commonplace statements, known statements about divided houses and divided kingdoms. They are not long for this world. But now comes the good news. Jesus reframes the pincer attack of family coming to take Jesus quietly home, and religious authorities looking to lock him up and take him out of circulation. And Jesus says, verse 27, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed, the house can be plundered. 
But Jesus' statement begs a question. Just who is stronger than Satan? And here's the good news. Mark has been anticipating precisely this question for three chapters. Indeed, one is stronger. We learn that fact from John the Baptist in Mark chapter 1, where John said, Jesus is the stronger one to come. Jesus points to the strong man who must be dealt with and tied up before anything else can definitively happen. The strong man is the root cause which must be addressed in order for meaningful progress and lasting change to take a place. The strong man on one level is Beelzebul, Satan, with whom Jesus confronts. This is the good news of the gospel that Jesus can and will get the job done against forces that we can't possibly fully understand. But on another level, and for us today specifically, the strong man has another layer of meaning. The strong man can represent a, a structure, an institution. The strong man could represent a stereotype, a prejudice, a bias, a falsehood. The strong man is that which holds us captive, continually exerting influence on us and power over our lives. And so many institutional things still do that. They have sway over us. Whatever form it may take, Tying up the strong man is the main point of what Jesus is saying. And binding the strong man as modeled by Jesus, well, it requires persistent courage and committed truth-telling. Jesus did not let the powers that be in the form of organized religious leaders he did not let them quiet his voice, divert his purpose, or usurp his mission. Jesus did not let his family of origin, who clearly loved and cared for him, who probably just wanted to protect him, who were very formative for him in his upbringing. Jesus did not allow the good intentions of others to divert him either. You see, not all of the institutional forces which have sway over us are patently bad. But that doesn't mean that the direction of their sway is necessarily helpful or good either. This passage puts before us the radical Jesus, defying assumptions, living abundantly, loving recklessly. Jesus is undeterred by opposition, willing to accept the words and deeds that will provoke and irritate even as they surprise and convict. He is focused on bearing witness to the reign of God, a reality which threatens the powerful and shatters the family while touching the untouchable and gathering those otherwise cast out. Those thought to be privileged are left standing outside while those previously looking over and left out are drawn into the circle. This, Jesus, sees the limits of our arrangements, sees the limits of our procedures and polity that we love, even our lectionary cycle. Pursuing God's will is what matters most to him. 
God's intent is healing and forgiveness. Mending the wounded, binding up the brokenhearted, and lifting the lowly. These are the goals of Jesus' life, what, whatever the cost. However many accusations, whatever the outrage, however many will be shocked or confused or disappointed, Jesus resolutely embraces what God has set before him. Then, and perhaps the most radical move of all, he invites us. He invites us to join him in this holy work. So that even when normally good institutions like family and religious order are acting against the thriving of God's kingdom, when that happens, remember the central gospel struggle which has already begun in Jesus' Galilean ministry in the first chapters of the Gospel of Mark, healing, exorcism, unmistakable forgiveness. The hallmarks of love the reason that Jesus came here to begin with, to reach out to us. Jesus didn't come to redeem the institutions. He came for us. He came for God's good creation. Amen. Friends, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death, which is our life until he comes again. Let us pray. Our God, we give thanks for the gift of your love. We give thanks that we celebrate in a physical way your radical love which gets inside of us and strengthens us and empowers us to do the work of ministry which may defy some social conventions which may rub up against long-held thoughts and feelings but it is your love that pierces the veil thank you for that love amen For those participating in worship online, I now invite you to take your communion elements as we will do so as well. I invite the church body to follow me outside and we will participate in the elements of communion in the front drive.